Okay, lecture 41 notes, an unusual value may change your mind, part two. Now we're gonna put some numbers to the kind of overall graphical way of thinking of it, uh, of the, the situation that we had last time. Okay, so uh, let's have a certain kind of tomato plant its mean yield is 12 pounds of tomatoes per plant, and the standard deviation is three pounds. We apply a new fertilizer to 36 of these plants and record a sample mean yield of 13.6 pounds. Does it seem the new fertilizer is effective? All right, so um, uh, the first thing you notice is, well, 13.6 pounds, that's bigger than 12, so that's a good sign, right? But of course, the question is, is it enough bigger? I know that if I were to take sample after sample after sample and compute the means, wait, you know, after I've applied the fertilizer, I would get different values and they should cluster around the 12. And so is this 13.6 just kind of what you would typically expect to happen in just picking any old sample or does it really indicate a shift? And the answer of course is gonna be, well, how big is the tail probability? How far away is it from the mean? 13.6 pounds doesn't seem like a lot far away from 12 pounds, but it depends on, on the standard deviation. It depends on what kind of variation we expect to see. So let's dive into this and, and work the problem through. All right, so the first thing we notice is that um, we'll assume W bar is normal with mean 12. So we're kind of thinking that it didn't change. And we're going to ask ourselves, do we get an unusual value for W bar? So the, the random variable that represents, you know, all possible, um, the, the probability distribution of all possible samples of the size where it used um, the fertilizer is um, three is, is a normal with uh, mean 12 standard deviation three over the square root of 36, right? which is normal with mean 12 and standard deviation 0 0.5. And that works because I have a blank there that says W bar is normal and that since N is equal to 36 greater than or equal to 30. So W bar is normal with 12 um, uh, mean and, and 0 0.5 standard deviation. So we're just checking that 36 being bigger than or equal to 30 is, is you know, our, our criterion for saying that, that, we, that it's normal. Okay. so. Is it bigger? So I'm thinking of think right tail probability, right? All right, we're gonna worry about the right tail probability. So the question is, is 13.6 big enough? Well, I have to give you, um, let's see, do I say here? Yeah, I, I, I say that I'm gonna pick alpha, which may have been given to us externally, some condition, um, to be uh, 0.025, right? 2.5%. So there's my cutoff for unusualness in terms of the tail probability. All right, let's compute the tail probability down below. I want to compute the probability that W bar is bigger than or equal to 13.6. That's the tail probability associated with this value that I got, right? And I will leave you to work this through. Here is what W bar is, and so you should be able to figure this out. You've done these kinds of problems all before. Convert to a z-score, right? And so I will tell you that what you'll end up with, you should have already gotten it all worked out. You've paused me and gotten it. You get probability that z is greater than or equal to 3.2. And if you look that up, you should get 0 0.007. Okay. And that is definitely less than 0 0.025. So the conclusion is, so this W bar equal to 13.6 is unusually large. All right, so it suggests, suggests that the population mean is now larger than uh, 12, right? And our picture is, if we have the curve here, the original curve where uh, the mean is 12 and the standard deviation is 0 0.05, and I'm gonna write that in. Um, somewhere out here, I have a tail probability of 0 0.025, right? And what I have found is my W bar equal 13.6, it has tail probability 
0.007. So clearly, it's farther out than this cut cutoff criterion for unusualness, right? In terms of z-scores, what I have is the z-score situation. You know, here's my z-curve. Um, and um, I have um, here my critical value, what we call a critical value is z.025. And if you look that up, that's, this again is 0 0.025 area. Z of 0 0.025 turns out to be, uh, doesn't it, um, it's 1.96, 1.96. And our z-score, W's z-score is 3.2, so it's out here, right, where the area .007. So I can look at this two ways. I can say the area associated with my W bar is smaller than the cutoff area. But really, how did I even compute all that? I computed that over here, so I don't even need to look at this one. I can just say, look, the area here is smaller than the, than the cutoff area. And I can also say, hey, the z-score for W bar is smaller than the z-score for my critical value, my cutoff critical uh, z-score for unusualness. So I conclude it's so unusual that probably this mean should be shifted over some. I don't know how much to shift it over because I don't know, you know, exactly where that W bar would be in relation to it, but it should be shifted over some probably because I got such a low probability over here for this W bar that I need it to enlarge it. Okay, that's what's going on. Um, so I, I say all that at the top of the second page. But then I say below that, note how we used the z-score of the sample mean, which means we essentially assumed that the population standard deviation would not change when the fertilizer was applied. I assumed that we ended up with um, this standard deviation here staying the same, the three staying the same, so that I can, after applying fertilizer and, and taking a sample, I take the three divided by the square root of n to get my standard deviation. But um, maybe the standard deviation, for, for the sample, but maybe the standard deviation of the original population would change upon applying the fertilizer. That could happen. Or it might be that we didn't even know that the standard deviation was three to begin with. Okay, so we might be in a situation where we don't, we simply don't have the standard deviation to work with. What do we do then? Here, let me get, this is a good contrasting color. Okay, well, um, so suppose we don't have that. Let's assume that, that, so we take our sample. So now, suppose we don't know that sigma equals three. It may have changed or maybe we didn't even know it originally. So from our sample of 36, we now have to compute not just x bar, or w bar, I guess, but we also have to compute the sample standard deviation. Sample standard deviation s, and let's say it comes out to be 2.4 pounds. All right, so we do, you know, W1 minus W bar, parenthesis squared, W2 minus W bar, parenthesis squared, add them all up, divide by 36 minus 1, divide by 35, take the square root. There we go, there's our S. So now we're going to think of T scores, though. And um, so uh, now think T scores, not Z scores. And what's the t-score again? t is, it's w bar minus our original mu divided by a s over the square root of n, correct? And so what we get is uh, w bar is, I'll go ahead and figure it out here, it's 13.6 minus 12 divided by 2.4 over the square root of 36. Okay, and you know, all of that for z-scores was over here. I didn't do it because you've, you've done it so much in the past. I just left it for you to do. But you had to do that calculation. I mean, almost this calculation, right? It's just that you were dividing by sigma over the square root of n instead of this s over the square root of n. Anyway, you do this, and I think you get, you get 4. 
all right? And I may be getting a little ahead of myself because um, this is T and the degrees of freedom are, um, sample size is 36 minus one, that's 35. All right, so I still have uh, alpha is 0 0.025, right? Is that, yeah, yeah, 0 0.025, okay? So now I go in and look at um, uh, degrees of freedom equal to 35, and I find area in one tail, 0 0.025, and I think in the table that I had up before, I didn't have degrees of freedom equal 35, so I would have had to use either 30 or 40, whichever I wanted, but I actually went to a different table and got the actual value here, or the, the approximation used in that table for degree of freedom equal 35, and you should get T sub 0 0.025 equal to um, 2.030. 2.030. Okay, so what that says is, let's get the picture here. The t random variable here, this is t, right, with a degree of freedom equal to 35. Um, my, my cutoff t score is t.025 is 2.030. That's my critical value beyond which I consider a t score to be unusual. And of course, what I'm getting is. Um, well, the area here is 0 0.025, and what I get is this value I calculated, W bar's T score is uh, 4, right, way out here, and so the, this area is smaller, correct? So again, in this example, we conclude W bar is so... Uh, unusually large has a large T score. We think um, the mean is larger than 12. The mean, what I mean, I mean population mean, right? The new population mean is larger than 12. Uh, the, in other words, the fertilizer worked. Okay. That's the basic idea. Notice something real quick here. Over here, because I could look up all kinds of z-scores, I'm able to do this problem kind of in two different ways. It's really, they're equivalent ways, but I can think in terms of comparing areas W's Z score has an area that's a lot smaller than the cutoff area, or I can just look at the Z scores themselves. W bar's Z score is so far out, it's, it's beyond the Z score of the critical value, which we call the critical value. So either way, I can see that W bar is unusually large. Over here, uh, I can compute W bar's T score. It's bigger than the cutoff T score, so that's enough for me to conclude that W bar is unusually large but I can't really compare areas, right? This area is 0 0.025. What's the area for a T-score of four if you have degrees of freedom equal to 35? Go look in the table and you're not gonna find a T-score of four probably in that table because it just has a limited number of, of T-scores based on what a limited number of, of tail probabilities, okay? So I can't compute exactly what this little area is here. Of course, I can see it's smaller than 0 0.025. That's that's obvious because 0.025 is all the area from, from here on back, and that's just from there on back. But um, so it is smaller, but really I don't need to compare exactly what the areas are. I can just look and say this T score is more extreme than my cutoff T score, my critical value. That's enough for me to say that W bar is. Um, is larger than um, I would expect it to be, which tells me that the mean has probably shifted, right? Okay, we'll stop there. Uh, we'll, this is introducing the idea of what we call hypothesis testing. We have two hypotheses here. One, fertilizer didn't work, the mean stayed the same. The other, fertilizer did work, and the mean shifted to something bigger in this case, all right? In this example, the uh, sample mean 
turned out to be so unusually large under the assumption that the population didn't shift, the population mean didn't shift, that we think that's probably wrong, the population mean probably did shift, okay? If we'd had a very large tail value here for, uh, in other words, a small t-score so that the tail probability would be big, that would indicate mm, not enough reason to think that it's shifted, perhaps, because I didn't get a very unusual value. Okay, we're going to formalize all of that in later lectures and um, look at exactly how to set up hypothesis testing and to draw conclusions, and we'll have a very precise procedure for that. But this will kind of gets us started.